Good morning. Good morning, Marge. Hi, Aaron. This is uh, Aaron Schubeck, the CEO of Standard Optical in Utah, one of Vision Monday's top 50 retailers. And we're here to talk a little bit about Aaron's experience with the COVID crisis, but more importantly, to kind of get a look at what Standard had been doing for its business before the crisis hit and how some of those approaches and technologies and attitudes have helped him and his team at the company cope with the crisis. So Aaron, thank you. Welcome to Vision Monday's Conversations with Top 50 Leaders. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, Aaron, for the people who may not know much about the heritage of Standard Optical, and you have quite a heritage, could you fill us in about that? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, we are based in Salt Lake City, but we were founded in 1911. So we're, um, you know, 109 years old, founded by my great-grandfather, Henry Schubach. So I'm a fourth generation Schubach to be involved in the business. Um, my father is still involved and he's a shareholder. Um, he doesn't come into the office as much, but he's still involved in the business. And so um, obviously we've, you know, we kind of know our way around the optical business and certainly in this uh, in this market, Salt Lake City. So we span the whole state with a primarily optometry based business, but we have an ophthalmology component to our business as well. Uh, so we have a large laser center, uh, primary ophthalmology uh, cataracts as well. So we have a hub and spoke model. We are very integrated in the medical model. We have a managed care entity. And then we have our, you know, our, our uh, 19 retail satellite offices that are doing frames and lenses and contacts and LASIK co-management all day, every day. Um, some locations we've been there since the 50s and 60s. And so um, when this COVID-19 thing came out, uh, or, you know, that we were going to have to close around the 19th, 18th, 19th of March, it would have been the first time in 109 years wow. that on a regular business day, you know, it was a Wednesday, Standard Optical was closed uh, for the first time in over 100 years. And so that was a... Um, that was a tough day for us making the announcement to our employees and uh, letting them know that, look, we have an obligation to the community. We also have an obligation to our patients and we have an obligation to their safety as well. I mean, meaning the employees uh, to shut it down uh, for only a couple of days, but we did do it. Yeah, that was such a tough day for so many people. And yeah. it was such a sudden, it felt like such a sudden thing. In addition to that, the closing you undergoing at that time, we had a 5.7 magnitude earthquake on the 18th of March, 7.05, and um, so that just added to the anxiety of my team, and uh, you know, it was one of those things where we, we sort of just all jumped into action. You're never really prepared for something like COVID or, or even an earthquake, but those two things together, you're definitely not prepared for. So we jumped into action, and you know, I mean, it, it's a testament to the resilience of my employees these people are, are like top-notch individuals and they handle it very professionally. And, uh, but it was a challenge for sure. Oh man, I can't imagine yeah. that one. I can't. Um, let's talk a little bit about the company since you've had this long history and since uh, you've been more closely overseeing things. My understanding is that last year you were examining ways that you wanted to reinvent your business anyway. So let's kind of go back to the beginning of 2019 and what you were thinking about and what were the areas that you wanted to change and what were you undergoing at that time? Yeah, so um, just to give you a little history, we had had a couple of flat years. Um, not a lot of new store growth. Same store growth was pretty stagnant. Uh, LASIK is still a ch was still a challenge and it was not growing like it used to. So we knew something had to change. We're right down the street from 1-800-CONTACT. We're a very tech savvy community. Great, uh, great economy here in Utah. The housing market is good, except for we were just not seeing a whole lot of lift. And so uh, basically what came out of our autopsy, if you will, was we had to change the, basically the entire structure of how we run our business, starting with our pay scale. Uh, we changed from a very highly incentivized, low base type of pay environment to a, an environment where it's a little higher base pay and, and less incentives. Um, we changed the KPIs that we look at, the way we monitor and manage our, our uh, remote teams. We uh, implemented a, a cadence of accountability and a scoreboard. Um, and then the patient experience, I think would be really the main thing or the, the basis for everything that we did, which was 
our distinct advantage is to be able to give the patient uh, a better experience than what they can get either online or at a big box retailer. And that was not something that we had capitalized on very well. Um, for years and years, we had been good at you know, customer service, et cetera. We wouldn't be in business 100 years if we were pissing people off. But we really didn't make it the cornerstone of, of everything we did. And so uh, starting mid-year last year, the patient experience is really uh, became the, the centerpiece, the cornerstone to what we do, partly in, uh, because of some training that we got from a local company called Qualtrics, who's now part of the SAP family, and our survey data that we were getting, our Google reviews. Um, and so we, we changed the way we dispense glasses. We changed our dress code. We changed yeah. the way we answer the phone. Um, Did you go through a, you went through a kind of a strategic review then, it sounds like, um, in exactly. order to know what to target and, and the prioritization of that. Yeah, yeah, it was a strategic review, exactly. So we had some, you know, I belong to a couple of groups through the OptiPort uh, family where we could share information and that certainly helped. But really what, what the telltale sign was is we listened to the patients. Uh, we had 70,000 surveys in our system oh. and we read them. <laughs> we read them and we listened to what they were saying and we implemented the changes that we thought uh, was a, a, common, uh, a common theme. And we put our egos aside and we changed things that needed to be changed and we didn't allow folks to get, you know, feelings hurt or anything like that. It was an autopsy without blame. And my leadership team really, uh, really stepped up and uh, we made some serious changes that were scared, you know, scary. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it was because not everybody likes change, that's for sure, right. even when it's intentional. Um, so if you had to summarize, you had told me previously about sort of a three-pronged approach. Um, how, how did you tackle, it sounded like you had to do uh, from an HR point of view for your team, for your executives to uh, incentivize them and bring them on board and get them, you know, committed. But uh, tell me your, yourself a little bit about how you looked at this process. Well, so, you know, we looked at um, simplifying everything that we do to make sense for everybody across the entire organization. So the my goals for the company are understood all the way down to the, the lab technician that started yesterday. Um, that what we're doing is helping people see better, period. Whether that's glasses, contacts, or LASIK, we're, we're improving the quality of life of the community citizens here through, uh, through their vision. And that's first and foremost. Um, but we do that in multiple ways. We've got our brick and mortar strategy, but we also have a telemedicine strategy. Yeah. Uh, and then we have a mobile eye care strategy. So we want to listen to the patient and say, hey, tell us how you want your eye care delivered. If you don't want to come out to us, maybe we'll come to you. If you don't want us to come to you, maybe you can do it via telemedicine from the comfort of your own living room. Um, so we have those three pieces of, of our delivery huh. channel, if you will, that, that are relatively new. So your, your approach was um, embracing your, your contacts with customers, whether it was virtual or in real life, it was a overall 360 degree kind of approach, it sounds like. Certainly, it was you know, uh, in the summer of last year, but that also really helped bear fruit or at least keep people calm when the, when the virus hit too, because we were proficient at communicating with our patients. Yeah, uh, they were used to hearing from us. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's talk a little bit about that communication. Um, how did the way you communicated with patients about what you were doing in the latter part of last year contrast with what you had done before? And then maybe we can talk about when this crisis hit. So I think when we do one-to-one -one marketing, which is you know the opposite of mass media, we don't do mass mailers, we don't do a whole lot of TV anymore, we used to do tons of this. Uh, we're talking to individual patients based on the demographics that we know about them. Uh, their age, gender, we know what they're wearing, if they're wearing a multifocal, et cetera. We might send a cataract offer to someone you know, that's not gonna get the same offer as a 13-year-old. So um, we were, were talking to them about healthcare, first of all, the health of their eye. Um, you know, common things that are not necessarily offer driven. So every time they open up a message from us, it's not a, hey, it's a two pair sale or it's a free eye exam sale. They're looking to us for basic healthcare knowledge, which really helped at the onset of the virus because we had sent out a mass mailer to everybody, letting them know that we're gonna close uh, most of our stores, all except four. We're here for emergency care. If you're wearing contact lenses, if you're wearing dailies, throw them away and we'll extend your prescription and order you more. Don't overwear your lenses. Wash your hands, get rid of your, your cases. All these things, the contact lenses were really a, a, an area of concern for us. But we were able to communicate with them uh, openly because they were used to that. 
Yeah, they had gotten they had kind of gotten familiar with that yeah, way of communicating. Um, this communication that you put in place last fall, and let's say the second half of last year, um, was that also a graphic change in the way people encountered your brand and what your stores looked like? Tell us about the connection. Yes, there. so we've embarked on a remodeling of a, of a good chunk of our stores for the last couple of years. Um, but yes, this was an entire rebrand. I had been with the same ad agency for 20 years, uh, a local company here who was more of a TV type of enterprise and did a great job building our brand. We were very happy with what they did for a long time. But we migrated to a company called National Strategic and Eugene and his team is based out of Cleveland and they specialize in web reputation, one-to-one uh, -one digital marketing so we can talk to individual patients, patient database mining, cross-pollination, and also the creative. So they did revamp the look of, of our stuff. Um, it was new and you know it's one of those things where it's an acquired taste maybe for a guy like me because I know what I think and how, how the brand should be represented. Um, and they've done a great job and it's been a home run. We had spent very, very little dollars managing our web reputation and our reviews. Yeah. And we immediately got from three stars to five stars in every location, you know, within the first four weeks. Um, oh, that's amazing. We did, we did the websites, we redid everything, all of our direct mail, all of our recall messaging. So it was a major undertaking. So this also represented, it was, it was an investment that you made uh, to, uh, you know, to be able to implement all of these changes, the training, the marketing, the communication, the technology, the data. Um, can you explain that a little bit um, before we get into the crisis period we're now? Um, what did that represent and um, what was important to you when you took that on? Yeah, so here's what I would say. I, our industry, you know, I'm speaking from the standpoint of a regional chain. Certainly the big folks are going to have internal IT departments that can help them build software systems that they need. Independent ODs may have some similar struggles like us. But we, it's a, we have a hard time getting data out, getting actionable data out of our point of sale or our EHR system and into our hands, in, into the appropriate people's hands timely. So we have our KPI scoreboards. We had our KPI scoreboards. Then it took 10 days after the close of the month to get the final percentages, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's just too late to make a change. Um, you know, we, if we made a mistake or we're doing something wrong in the middle of the month, we didn't know till 40 days later, then I can get it out to my district managers and managers to implement the changes mm -hmm. and it just didn't work for me anymore. So we basically, what we did is we built a data warehouse we're on an Acuity Logic platform, which is an Ifinity software, and we pull the data out and we put it into a data warehouse. And I have an IT department that uses um, a Microsoft product called Power BI, a business intelligence platform, that gives us real-time da uh, dashboards. So I have a dashboard for me. My DMs have one that has a few different things on it, all the way down to the store level and the doctors that has real-time mm. KPIs for uh, how their day is today. Yeah. And we do stuff based on those numbers. We manage the business based on the KPIs. There's no gut instinct or no gut feel or any of that uh, in this business anymore. We do what the numbers tell us to do. Mm -hmm. And we hold people accountable to it. And I'll tell you what, that's what they want. Um, you know, it's sort of like a dog. You know, a trained dog is a happy dog. Employees that know where they stand, where they stand, you know, where the scoreboard is, are happy employees. They know what they need to do to get better. Mm -hmm. They know when they're hitting their, their target. They know when they're not hitting their target. So we've seen our team really latch onto it, and it's a daily cadence. They, they look at their KPIs three times a day, first thing yeah, in the morning, at a, midday, yeah, and again in the very, afternoon. Very so powerful and a good description of the connection. A lot of times people f are afraid that data will replace people, but it doesn't, it, it can enhance what they do for you. That's, that's exactly so what it does. When it comes to, um, let's say now uh, the crisis comes uh, and it was such mm -hmm. a sudden emergence and you have to make this painful decision to close, yeah. What did you feel when you had to do your first powwows with your teams about how you were going to handle this um, yeah. based on where the progress you had made so far from telehealth to your data uh, to your marketing and your communications? What, how did you prioritize what to do? And, and yeah. as you've started to reopen, let's talk about how that served you. Well, so for the first time in my career, there was a little bit of a conflict of interest in what I believe was my duty to my patients, my employees, and my community at large. Mm -hmm. I have a duty to take care of my patients. Um, 
no matter what they, they have going on, I've always been there and been open to help them. And that was at risk at this moment. I have a duty to my employees. Uh, they, they rely on, on my leadership to put food on their table. But we also have a duty to the community at large. And so it was conflicting. It was really a, a challenging thing. But really what we did is, uh, like we were doing earlier in that year, we listened to the patients. And even though we closed all of our locations on the 18th, we actually reopened uh, four of them in regional hubs, so across the state of Utah. But it was based on the calls that we were getting from our patients and the messages they were leaving. And oh, the, uh, that emergency you know, care period, you mean? That's what you yes. were able to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really, that was, that was telling us after we shut everything down, we literally opened up the very next day. Um, and it's because we listened to the patients. Now the CDC and the uh, AOA came out with their recommendation to postpone routine care. And our position on this, although it, you know, I think some people may interpret it differently, is that we were to take medical patients ahead of anybody else, which made sense to us, to re relieve or alleviate any stress that could be put on the uh, urgent care or ER system which is exactly what we did. We were available for emergencies and urgent issues. Mm -hmm. But this would be a patient who was a minus four, who's missing a contact lens in one eye. So he's a minus four in both eyes, only has one lens. It's not a medical emergency technically, but I'll tell you what, uh, there wasn't a day that went by where patients weren't in tears because of the things that we did uh, for them while everybody else was closed. Mm -hmm. Now our protocol was extremely strict it yeah. still is to this day, and I don't expect yeah. it to change anytime soon. But they were very appreciative, and we were extremely careful to make sure we were taking urgent and medical patients uh, first uh, ahead of anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, since you've started to reopen now, correct? Um, yes. When did you start to reopen the locations? And just very briefly, um, is, has it met your expectations of what you were going to see when you reopened? Or, uh, and are you cautious now, or are you feeling a little more optimistic? Yes, we had a slow phase up, uh, ramp up, I should say, where we went from uh, four locations to seven, seven to 11, and then we opened up all of them last Monday. Oh. Uh, so we've been open for two weeks. Now, we were not near, nearly the hot spot here in Utah that some other communities were. However, um, we were, ex were extremely cautious. Our employees needed to be trained. This was not something where you can just stick a poster on the wall and say, hey, there's our protocol and that's what we're doing. Uh, we did conference calls, we sent out videos, but we did trainings just about every week. Uh, we do a conference call, an all company conference call every week while we were closed. Mm -hmm. And we went through all of our expectations. We uh, acquired some our PPE that we needed at least to get us through the summer. So that's 12,000 masks, um, you know, 12,000 uh, gloves. We've got shields and four opter shields and breath guards for all of our equipment. And so the training was the biggest piece there that made me nervous. Uh, was I nervous about patients showing up or anything like that? Not necessarily. I thought that the numbers would come back slowly if we got open and we did everything the right way. We're taking less patients than we were, so we used to do three exams an hour. We're now doing only two an hour. We only allow one patient in the location. Uh, but as of today, and so we're we're um, you know we're in the, the third part, of the the third third of the month, uh, with two thirds gone, and we are up over May last year, believe it or not. Yeah. So we're going to actually see it. We're going to see an increased month, and I mean it's knock on wood, and I don't necessarily want to jinx us, but. We're up double digits. We're going to be up double digits and decent double digits over last year, May. Mm -hmm. Now we had a crummy May last year, but we've seen some pent up demand. Patients have been home holding off on their contact lenses because they couldn't or their glasses or whatever it is. And we're seeing those folks rush right in and get yeah. taken care of. Yeah. Very encouraging. So, yeah. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about some of the learnings that you've <clears throat> accomplished what which of those changes either that you made before or things that you're seeing patients respond to now i can't ask you to project exactly when business would return to mm -hmm. it's what it should have been but what are the elements of what you're doing that you think will be long-term parts of our optical business going forward you know, I think the most important part is to reiterate the, the sense that and the feeling that we are medical providers first and foremost, as opposed to retailers. And I think there's that, you know, identity crisis a little bit in our business um, that we, we're, we're both, but we start by bringing in a, a customer 
who leaves as a patient under the care of a doctor. And so our doctors <clears throat> are professionals and our patients are gonna listen to them and they really are listening to them. So it's incumbent on our ODs to explain everything that's going on, the importance of having an annual eye exam, why they need whatever it is that they're gonna recommend that they need and to uh, follow the course of action of their optometrists. And I think we're seeing people maybe take the advice of an OD more so than just Googling something or uh, taking their neighbor's advice about, you know, which laser center they should go to. Um, we're, we're engaging with our patients more than ever and they're listening to our doctors. And so the doctors have, it's incumbent on them to really take that and hold on to that because our industry at one point sort of gave that away. And we were doing eye exams for $1 and just spin and grin, better or worse, one or two, buy glasses. And that isn't the kind of business we want to be in. We want to be a primary care provider. And so that's the main thing I think we can glean from this. Is that yeah, that's a big we, opportunity, isn't it, for, for the industry so. for optometry. Mm -hmm. And what about the patient's mindset towards uh, eyewear and contact lenses? Have you noticed any changes there in terms of, what they want to spend, things are a little precarious in the economy. Yeah, so you know, we would you would expect people to be uh, pinching pennies a little bit. Um, I will tell you my experience through September 11th and the 2008 housing crisis, and then obviously we've lived through two world wars, a Great Depression, and other recessions, et cetera, that this business is built to be recession-proof. When folks are not making big ticket purchases, maybe they're not going to buy a new Jeep this year or take everybody to Disney World, they're still going to they're going to have a little bit extra money for things like like what we sell. Mm -hmm. um, if your kids need glasses or contacts before going back to school, uh, we've noticed that they will spend money on it. And our average tickets are up about 30 bucks. So $30 uh, over our, our average ticket prior to the, the virus. Now, the environment at our stores has changed. So we don't allow patients to try on a million frames and touch a bunch of things. The optician is right there with them with a, a disinfected tray yeah, and we it. select the frames. Yeah, so we do that for them. Well, guess what? When they pull off three or four frames, uh, we're seeing our multiple pair transactions go way up. They're, they're buying three frames. Hmm. Um, so they're not touching a bunch and, you know, going back and forth and buying one or maybe walking out with an exam only. If we pull down three or four frames, we're going to expect them to be buying those. Hmm. And um, for the most part, they're listening to their opticians and they're following our in-store protocol. We've seen average ticket go up. Now, does that mean they may, post, they may uh, prolong their interval and say, well, I come in every year, maybe I'll come in every two years now. And so that's why they're bulking up on their eyeglass purchase. That certainly could be the case. Mm. Um, but we can worry about that through our recall programs and things like that. But people are not skimping on primary, excuse me, on uh, premium upgrades. So that's anti-reflective transitions. We're yeah. in the 70% rates, AR high index. We're seeing all of those numbers go up. Mm. So. And when it comes to things like um, technology, um, intake of patients, uh, uh, appointment scheduling, verifying claims, telehealth or consult services, do you think that that will be a new reality throughout our business? I think so. I mean, I think this is an event that's really pushed our industry forward, you know, in terms of uh, the technology that we need to make a seamless uh, eye exam visit. So we're one of the few, you know, uh, optician, excuse me, uh, physicians that require you to fill out a bunch of paperwork and do all this stuff that's not electronic or not very easily. Um, so yes, I think we're going to be doing a lot of things pre-visit. So you're going to fill out all your check-in intake information ahead of time. Uh, we have a no contact eye exam. We, mm -hmm. use a, we use a smart mirror technology for all of our measurements. That's an iPad piece that we, we can do everything without touching the patient at all. Um, and then most of their, their intake information is done remotely, either on our app or on the website prior to their visit. So family health, medical history, that kind of stuff is done ahead of time. Yeah, um, oh, very great. Uh, yeah. One last question. Um, we were running out of time, but if you had to um, speak to other colleagues of yours uh, or independents across the industry, mm -hmm. what do you think is the most um, uh, insightful thing that you have learned uh, coming through such a crisis? It could be a leadership suggestion or it could be just an attitude suggestion. Yeah. What's gonna help people make it through this? There's so much uncertainty right now. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's, a, that's a tricky question. I you know, here, my advice would be this, we're primary care physicians and our patients need your expertise. Yeah. They need to hear what you, what you have to say because 
it's, it's an environment where people are scared. Uh, they don't really know what's going on. This is new territory. This isn't like a, a housing market crash or oil prices have gone up or a, a regular recession or a military conflict. This is something we haven't been through before. Um, and if we have, it certainly was you know, not this generation. They're looking to, to doctors to tell them uh, what the right thing to do is, what the course of action is. So don't forget that, that we are the, the medical experts in their mind and we're a physician that they visit much more frequently than uh, you know, oftentimes their primary care you know, family physician, that kind of thing. Then, then my other piece of advice would be, you know, uh, happy employees create happy patients. Mm -hmm. And this is the time to not abandon your employees, uh, but, but listen to them and embrace them. And you'd be surprised at the concessions they will make for you uh, if that needs to be something that you have to discuss. Um, but our, our employee morale is as high as it's ever been. And we just believe that happy employees provide happy patients. And so if I want special service for my customers or my patients, uh, that starts with the way I treat my own employees. Yeah, wonderful advice. Well, listen, thank you, Aaron, so much. It's a Thanks, privilege Mark. to talk to you. Best of luck. Thanks again. You too. Thank you.